Income tax 2023-2024. Accrual method. Get ready and some coffee so we can avoid the government forcing us to move into a shack with income tax preparation. 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in publication. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts. A must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six-pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six-pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six-pack-like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. In 334, Tax Guide for Small Business for Individuals Who Use Schedule C Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, noting the first half of the income tax formula is basically an income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship Schedule C ultimately rolling into the income line, noting that the Schedule C itself is also basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses otherwise known as business deductions resulting in in essence net business income rolling from the schedule c to line one income of the equation represented by the form 1040 first page of the form 1040 here the schedule c ultimately rolling into line eight additional income from schedule one this is the Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments, Part Number 1, Schedule C, rolling into Line 3, Business Income or Loss from the Schedule C. Here is a Schedule C, Profit or Loss from Business, having a P&L, Profit and Loss, or Income Statement Format, where we have income minus the expenses or business deductions. We've been talking about accounting methods. Realizing, once again, the Schedule C is basically a form of financial statement. The major two financial statements being balance sheet, income statement. It makes sense to have the income statement on a tax return, which is calculating taxes on a, uh, cap on a uh, federal income tax-based system. And we're going to be taxing people based on the net income. So how do we get down to the net income? Well, we're going to have to categorize and record the income minus the expenses. The easiest way to do that is to follow the cash typically, which would be a cash-based system we talked about last time. Now, the cash-based system is something that will typically be used for individual income taxes for most deductions other than the Schedule C, such as the Schedule A itemized deductions or Schedule 1 deductions. However, on the Schedule C, we could still elect to do a cash-based system if appropriate, or we might choose the accrual-based system. When we think about bookkeeping for a business, we typically think about large businesses, and those publicly traded businesses are usually going to be on an accrual-based system, a bit more difficult system to work with sometimes, but more accurate. And in those cases, we have auditors, companies that audit the publicly traded companies to make sure that their financial statements, balance sheet, income statement are recorded properly. 
when we have taxes on a sole proprietorship, we don't have separate companies that come in and audit, which is one of the reasons you might choose the simple method like the cash-based method. However, the accrual-based method is still, uh, is still fairly easy to use and might be more appropriate, particularly in some instances where you have to use accrual components, such as if you have inventory, because recording inventory as an asset and tracking it is an accrual thing to do. If you track accounts receivable, you invoice clients tracking accounts receivable, you are doing an accrual thing when you invoice because usually you're recording revenue at that point in time. If you track accounts payable, less common for small businesses, but mid to large businesses will ha have accounts payable. Accounts payable is an accrual based account. So if any of those kind of fit into your accounting or bookkeeping system, inventory, accounts receivable, or accounts payable, you might want to think about whether or not you should be on an accrual basis rather than a cash-based method or possibly some hybrid between the two of them. Okay, so under an accrual method of accounting, you generally report income in the year earned and deduct capitalized expenses in the year incurred. I should say deduct or capitalize expenses in the year incurred. So in other words, on the cash base system, we saw that, ca that revenue will be recorded when we receive the cash, which is usually pretty close to the same point in time that we earned it. So that's why the cash base system kind of works because those two things are pretty close in time frame. On the accrual based system, on when we think about income, we're gonna be recording the income when we earned it. So if we were at a food truck store, for example, or if we sold something at a food truck, when we sell something, we get paid at the same point in time. Note that both the cash-based system and accrual-based system will record income at the same time. Uh, but if the time frame is different, that's when, that's when the two methods come into play and you can see the differences. If you're an accountant or lawyer, for example, and you bill the client for the work that you did in the past, increase in accounts receivable, recording revenue at the point in time that you invoice, now you're recording revenue when you made the invoice on an accrual-based method. And when you receive the cash in the future, typically you wouldn't record revenue again. That's usually when you would be on an accrual-based system. If you were on a cash-based system, in that case, you wouldn't record the, the cash or the income until you got the cash. Similarly, on the expense side of things, we, we might go into more scenarios uh, shortly with that. So the purpose of an accrual method of accounting is to match income and expenses in the correct year. So this is considered to be the best standard for matching up the income and expenses in the proper years, which is the best for measuring performance and being able to compare year over year comparisons as well as current company information to other related companies if we want to benchmark, which is the reason the accrual method is used for publicly traded companies to be as transparent as possible so investors can make accurate comparisons year over year and with the current uh, year to, to prior years in the, in the current company and other businesses. So income general rule under the accrual method, you generally include an amount in your gross income for the tax year in which all events that fix your right to receive the income have occurred and you can determine the amount with reasonable accuracy. So if you're gonna say on the income side, I'm gonna record income, not when I get the cash, but basically when I did the work. The cash-based system you can see is easier because then I just say, well, it hit the bank account, basically. Uh, there are exceptions and people try to manipulate that, but you can see it's, very, it's fairly easy. But on the accrual side, then the question is, well, when exactly do we record it? The general rule is when you've earned it, but you can imagine all kinds of situations where that can, that can be a little bit more complex in terms of when you've actually earned it. From a bookkeeping standpoint, if you use QuickBooks, for example, a kind of business that does the work first and bills the client or invoices the client will typically be using an accrual system because the invoice is recording income when you build them and you haven't yet received the cash. So if you have accounts receivable, you're basically doing an accrual thing for the most part. 
So let's go over this for tax year in which all events that fix your right to receive the income have uh, occurred and you determine the amount with reasonable accuracy. So you've done the work in essence and you can determine the amount of income. So for a, tax, for a taxpayer with an applicable financial statement or other financial statement as the sec, uh, secretary may specify, the all events test for an item of gross income is considered met no later than when taken into account in an applicable financial statement or such other financial statement. So let's look at an example. You are a calendar year accrual method taxpayer. You sold a computer on December 28, 2023. So if we sell inventory, then when has the work been done? When we, when we have given away the inventory, right? Either when we shipped it, possibly that if it's still, if it's claimed to be the owners at the point of shipping, or is it the point in time that the recipient receives it. So you have that kind of issue with the with like inventory. So you build the customer in the first week of January 2024, but you did not receive payment until February uh, to th February 2024. You must include the amount received for the computer in uh, 2023. Why? Because you sold the computer, you did basically the work would be the general idea in uh, 2023. Quick logistics related note on this example before we move forward. The general idea here being that we did the work before the cutoff date, the cutoff date being the end of the year, in this case, December 31st, 2023, work having been done December 28th, 2023, but we didn't invoice or bill the client until January 2024 after the cutoff date. Now realize that if we're using software like a QuickBooks software to record our accounting, we might basically be using an accrual system and still have a problem here. In other words, we might be saying when we invoice the client, we're going to be recording an increase to accounts receivable at that point in time and record the revenue when we invoice or bill the client. But in this case, we didn't actually invoice or bill the client, enter the invoice into the accounting system until January 2024, even though the work was done in December 28th, 2023. So in other words, even if your accounting system is set up on an accrual based system, it still might not be perfectly aligned to a perfect accrual system because you could have these logistical issues, which might be more easily seen if you had like a job cost system, such as if you bill on a law firm, for example, in a law firm, you might take all of your staff, have them work, then count the hours that they worked and then send out invoices for the time that they worked. Then when the invoices go out, you increase accounts receivable recording revenue at that time to be paid at a later point. So even though you're doing an accrual process, when you enter the invoice, the work had actually been done in the prior month. So from a pure accrual standpoint, you should actually be pulling the revenue into the point in time the work was done, which was prior to the point in time that the invoice was entered. Now, this might not be a big issue for many small businesses, but it's just something to kind of point out, meaning if you have accounts receivable, you're basically most likely using an accrual method if you're using accounting software, but you could still have these cutoff issues in the case where you enter the invoice at a time frame after the time that the work was done. So you might wanna just be aware of that. Income special rules. So the following are special rules that apply uh, to advanced payments, estimating income and changing a payment schedule for services. So estimated income. If you include a reasonably estimated amount in gross income and later determine the exact amount is different, take the difference into account in the tax year in which you make the determination. So we, when we're trying to do an accrual method system, we might have to estimate the income that we have and an estimate means that we're not gonna be exact and then we might end up having to make a change. Do we need to go back to the prior year and make adjustments for the estimate not being exactly correct? Well, the easy thing to do would be to make the change in the current year, not amending the prior year. Change in payment schedule for services. So if you perform services 
for a basic rate specified in a contract, you must accrue the income at the basic rate, even if you agree to receive payments at a lower rate until you complete the services and then receive the difference. So now you're talking about a payment schedule that has been put in place. And some of this comes into play with specific types of industries. So for example, revenue recognition usually happens when we get the work done, when we do the work, which usually means when we, when we actually did the service uh, or like in a bookkeeping firm, when we actually did the work of the bookkeeping or when we gave the inventory, which in a normal retail store is when we give the inventory. But if you have longer term job cost systems, like in construction, then you have a situation where the work's not going to be done possibly for a long period of time. Questions arise as to when should revenue be recognized and what's going to be the billing uh, process for that revenue. And that gets into some more uh, complex issues in terms of revenue uh, recognition. Those areas are specialty areas. And as tax preparers, you might want to then question and think about whether you want to take on those clients for specific job cost systems using possibly completed contract or percentage of completion method, or that could be a, an area of specialty that other people don't have the, the knowledge to take on that may possibly you do. So advanced payments. Generally, you report advanced payments as income in the year you receive the payment. So now we have a situation where, where you're on an accrual based method and usually you don't record the, the income until you earn it. But what if you're doing bookkeeping work or something like that and you're gonna and they pay you in advance? They give you the money before you do the work. Well, normally that would be recorded as unearned revenue, a liability, and under an accrual-based method, and you wouldn't record income until you actually uh, have earned it. But the IRS is going is taking you know is likely to take a position to say, hey, look, if you already got the money, then you can afford to pay us the money, right? So the IRS might want now you got this prepayment situation where the IRS might be saying, hey, look, if you've already got the money, we want you to record it in income at that point in time so that you can <laughs> and pay the taxes while you have the money, right? However, if you receive an advance payment, you can elect to postpone including the advance payment in income until the till the next tax year. You cannot postpone including any payment beyond that tax year. So for more information, see publication 538 and section 451. Now, advance payments are things that are that are not typical to every uh, industry oftentimes. So in other words, most industries are going to get paid either at the same time they do the work, like as a food truck, or they're going to get paid after they do the work, like a law firm, then you bill someone and then they pay you later. Some places, however, you might have these advanced payments, such as rental companies, for example, that rent apartments or something like that. They're going to get possibly the last month rent f first or something like that, where they have a form of advanced payment. You might have a, a newspaper sales or in this new day and age, you have uh, companies that are providing software. So that might be a subscription model where you get paid in advance. So the question is, when do you have to recognize the revenue if, at the point in time that you got paid? Or should you be using the accrual method, which means you shouldn't be recognizing the revenue until you have earned it? So, so if you're in one of those industries where you get money before you do the work, then you want to think through a little bit more detailed. How are you going to do your accounting? Because some people don't understand those accounting methods in general. So you want to make sure that you understand your accounting. And then are there any differences in your accounting or things you need to take into consideration with regards to tax preparation and the rules with relation to advanced payments? Because the IRS, again, is more likely to say, we, we, if you get the money, we want to get a piece of the money when you get it, right? So, so although, again, you have this kind of exception right here. So in any case, expenses under an accrual method of accounting, you generally deduct or capitalize business expense when both of the following apply. Number one, all events test has been met. Uh, the test has been met when A, all events have occurred that fixed the fact of liability and B, uh, the liability can be determined with reasonable accuracy. 
So now we're on the expense side of the income statement, which are basically deductions. Those are the things that are bad for business. We don't like expenses, but for taxes, they're good because they're deductions. So, so the IRS is going to be more skeptical, of course, of increasing things like the expenses. Now, on a cash-based system, it would be when we paid, when money went out, that would be the determining factor or the thing that would indicate that an expense happened, although we saw rules on, and exceptions of people trying to manipulate things on a cash-based system. On an accrual-based system, it's basically when, when, you have, when the work was done on the other person's side. You received the goods or services or have claim to the goods or services, right? Or you received the work that have been done. So all of the events occurred that fixed the fact of liability, meaning someone did work for you or gave you goods or services. And that means there's a liability. You owe them money, whether you have paid them uh, or not at that point in time. Number two, economic performance has occurred. So economic performance, what is that? You generally cannot deduct or capitalize a business expense until economic performance occurs. If your expense is for property or services provided to you or for your use of property, economic performance occurs as the property or services are provided or as the property is used. So if your expense is for property or services you provide to others, economic performance occurs as you provide the property or services. An exception allows certain recurring items to be treated as incurred during a tax year, even though economic performance has not occurred. So basically, obviously, when we're thinking about things that we are paying for, we are, you can, we're doing this in terms of economics, business, for a business purpose, in essence. And, you know, we have to receive economic performance, meaning they did something that's going to be useful for us that we're paying for, for business reasons, generally, that's the general idea. Now realize that if you if you purchase something large, fixed assets, equipment, then we don't expense it at the point in time that we receive it, because we're going to use that fixed asset in order to generate revenue in the future. So those are capitalization rules then we have to put it on the books as an asset and use the depreciation rules to allocate the cost over the useful life of when we actually have used it. That's the general accounting concept. And we'll talk about depreciable assets in much more detail later. So for more information on economic performance, see economic performance under accrual method in publication 538. Example, you are a calendar year taxpayer and use an accrual method of accounting. You buy office supplies in December 2023. You receive the supplies and the bill in December, but you pay the bill in January 2024. You can deduct the expenses in 2023 because all events that fix the fact of liability have occurred. The amount of the liability could be reasonably determined and economic uh, performance occurred in that year. So your office supplies may qualify as a recurring expense. In that case, you can deduct them in 2023, even if the supplies are not delivered until 2024 when economic performance occurs. All right, let's break that out a little bit more detail. Uh, you are a calendar year taxpayer and use an accrual method. You buy office supplies in December. So that's before the cutoff date which is the end of the year, December 31st, 2023. We bought them before December. You receive the supplies and the bill in December, but pay for the bill in January. So now you've got the supplies, which means ec economic performance has happened. Therefore, you should be recording them, you would think, in 2023 because you received them before the date. But you didn't record them uh, until January. You didn't pay the bill until January. Now, let's just look at this from a logistics standpoint again. Most of the time when you buy stuff, if you bought office supplies, you might buy it online and have it shipped to you. Normally, you're going to be paying for it at the point in time you order it these days, right? Which means that you're, that you're probably going to be recording it in your system uh, at the point in time you order it. So you buy something online, you're going to be ordering it and possibly paying for it either with a credit card or a cash payment at the, that point in time, which means it's going to be recorded in your accounting system uh, when you actually pay it would be the general idea. However, 
Uh, and most small businesses, that's how their payables work, right? They're going to buy stuff either on credit with a credit card or with their cash, which means they're kind of on a cash based system for the most part. And you'll be recording your expenses at the point in time you purchase it. But if you're using accounts payable to buy things, meaning the bill comes in, you enter it in your system as accounts payable that you're not going to pay until a later point in time then the accounting system should account for that, right? Because now you're gonna put a bill which increases the expense typically and increases the liability, which you would pay at a later point. So if you're using accounts payable, then again, the accounting system should properly record this and you would be okay uh, generally. It's only a situation where for whatever reason you ordered the goods, but didn't actually pay for them at the point of ordering them and then you receive them and then you entered the payment in January and hadn't entered anything into the accounting system before that, that you that you could possibly run into this kind of problem where your normal bookkeeping system would kind of be incorrect. So just to point that out kind of from a logistical uh, standpoint, most people, small businesses logistically are kind of on a cash based system recording the things when they buy them, right? because they're gonna be using possibly bank feeds or something if they're using like a QuickBooks. Okay, so keeping inventories. When the production, purchase, or sale of merchandise is an income producing factor in your business, you must generally take inventories into account at the beginning and end of your tax year unless you are a small business taxpayer. Now inventories of course complicate things because inventory in and of itself is an accrual thing. And therefore, when you put it on the books as an asset, instead of expensing it, when you purchase it, you're doing something that's accrual related. Plus, the IRS is going to want a separate schedule uh, to the Schedule C, which is the cost of goods cal sold calculation, which includes inventory, which is why you need the beginning and inventory ending inventory to help you out with those uh, calculations. So if you must account for an inventory, you must generally use an accrual method of accounting for your purchase and sale. For more information, you can see inventories later. So if you have inventory, then you wanna think carefully as to whether you wanna be on a cash or accrual based system, because you might have to, in some cases, be on an accrual based system, and then think about how your accounting is going to work so that you can properly track your accounting, of course, and also deal with your tax needs, which might include the cost of goods sold calculation. And that's gonna mean that you need to track at least beginning and ending inventory. Right? Special rule for related persons. You cannot deduct expenses and interest owed to a related person who uses the cash method of accounting until you make payments and the corresponding amount is included in the related person's gross income. So related person like family, for example, the IRS is going to be skeptical that transactions are not arm's length transactions and therefore manipulation will be taking place. So determine the relationship for this rule as of the end of the tax year for which the expense or interest would otherwise be deductible. If a deduction is not allowed under this rule, the rule will continue to apply even if your relationship with the person ends before the expense or interest is includable in the gross income of that person. Related persons include members of your immediate family, including siblings, other whole or half, your, uh, either whole or half, your spouse, uh, ancestors and lineal descendants. For a list of other related persons, see section 267 of the Internal Revenue Code.